graduated from the School of Design and Media, NTU, and um, that was in 2009. Um, I started photography consciously, professionally, at the age of 16. Um, that was the first time I entered a commercial studio as a commercial assistant. And um, I worked there for two years, and subsequently I went on to another commercial studio. Um, and that was prior to my university. And when I entered university, I stopped for full-time studies. Well, I was first introduced to the large format by one of my tutors in NTU. Um, his name was CJ Samia. And um, it was a, for a particular module called Contemporary Landscapes. And for that module, we were required to use the large format. And, um, the first few times I used it, um, it didn't turn out, I quite enjoyed it, it didn't turn out very well according to CJ, but um, it was a wonderfully slow and painful process and um, it being excruciating um, actually helped me open the doors to a very different kind of state of mind when photographing and the fact that the medium actually slows down your process, gives you, forces you to give yourself space to think and time to think as well. Mm. So um, I was attracted to the process um, as part of a, like almost like a meditative practice and um, it soon moved on to something quite spiritual for me. How do I decide the places? Um, I don't decide the places, the places decide me. <laughs> um, it, was, it was more of like a, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it right, but it was more of like a rediscovering and reclaiming the city. It's, it was a kind of practice that engages the idea and uh, um, it's called a flanier, whereby you just walk aimlessly from one point to the other. And, and that's how you you create your own kind of uh, mental maps of spaces and, and spaces with its histories and spaces with its memories and spaces with, with your kind of imagination of how it will be in the future. And um, these places spoke to me in a certain way that um, that gave me like a kind of um, it gave me a kind of empty feeling. That's why I felt that, that, that um, the desire to actually try to fill it up with uh, something that, like an activity or, or my own kind of meaning. Mm. So Concrete Euphoria is about um, reclaiming the city that I live in. Um, I was, in junior college, I was studying the text of um, some local um, poets and some local writers and often they will lament um, how Singapore is the city of uh, Eurasia and like you know the the old National Library that we are I think we are just right in front is like gone and people will like go like have a huge sense of nostalgia um, where are these buildings where did these buildings go to why do we have to tear them down um, for what for what kind of for what sake or for what sacrifice are we having in pursuit of that kind of progress to like a kind of modernity and it is a very like the whole idea of skyscrapers and, and big cities and bling is it's a very western idea of of um, a developed country of progress so so for me using the camera to actually document this um, I use the word document because it's, it's a kind of record but I will talk about that later um, was to more to reclaim that sense of um, that that very um, very dual sense like that puts me in kind of dilemma where whether I'm like I can't I can't figure out whether I'm upset that things are moving too quickly and I can't catch up or whether it excites me and it energizes me at the same time so it's trying to like uh, re-engage with these two ideas as I photograph for this piece of work difficulties. Um, I think editing is one of the most difficult parts because at the end of the day, like, um, there will be tons of images that I have to go through. Um, so actually, because it's a very technique-based, uh, technique-driven kind of um, exercise, um, 
at the end of the day to critically ask myself what am I going to show and what do I really want out of the work was quite a challenging process. Like, um, it meant a lot of questioning and it meant a lot of thinking back of what, what I've done over the years and, and what I would like people to see my work as. And with that, all these um, very critical points um, in mind, I had to shape and mould the body of work um, very tightly. So it, it almost seems like, like I have like 300 pieces of large format information and it just may mean cutting down to like just seven to eight pieces. Mm. And, and sometimes cutting off a few pieces would be as painful as like cutting off my arm. Probably that would be more painful, but yeah, it's, it's, it's as difficult as that. I, I was not di directly referencing any photographers, but the photographers that I was looking at while, we, uh, while making my Concrete Euphoria was uh, Hiroshi Sugimoto. But almost for the very extreme, like because his works are usually quite empty and quite zen, but mine is very very dense. So we we I kind of mirrored him in uh, a very contrasting and polarizing uh, perspective. And then the other was uh, Andres Kursky, um for his very very dynamic landscapes with uh, very dense details and um, things just um, like the entire frame being filled with many, many details that, that actually caught me and, and that whole idea of looking at things from a very macro level, from some, some, somewhere, a perspective that's really far away mm -mm, and looking at scale as well. The title is The Wax on, my, on Our Fingers. Uh, it's a direct translation to the Indonesian title which is uh, Malam di Jari Kita. Malam meaning um, in Java, meaning two, it's like a pun, it's, it means two meanings. Um, one, it means night. And one, it means like the kind of like wax that um, people who make batik use. And then, um, so Malam di Jari Kita could mean the wax on my, our fingers or the night on our fingers. And um, it, it was a, a social relational approach to thinking about a culture that is considered dated and communities that are considered left behind. And, um, it was also a kind of project where I tried to re-explore a sense of self and a sense of learning in my work. Um, we, we strictly wanted to use the same kind of medium that the ladies were using because we didn't felt, feel that with the, the kind of time that we have and with the kind of um, materials that they have been using every day, we, we felt that it was not fair to make them learn something new. And uh, instead, we had to make our own sacrifices, and it turned out to be very positive for us. Also, that that we put our position, our own positions, into learning something new for them. So uh, it turned out that that cyanotype was the best medium to engage in the same medium that they worked with every day, which is like cotton material. Yeah, and for that to be able to combine a photographic process onto cotton, um, cyanotype was the most readily available in Indonesia. The batik makers in Java, for a very, very long period of time, remain very anonymous. So when you think about batik, we think about big brand names or big owners of batik. Like, um, and they will somehow be the patrons of batik, are the like, extremely rich, and they will somehow be getting that whole image and um, grandeur and status of batik uh, onto themselves, but only for the sake of ownership. Um, so many often times like, people do not know who are the people who actually make it. So by putting their portraits in front of their work, actually consciously state that, hey, this piece of work is made by this person. And it was a form of recognition, um, a form of celebration, and also a form of identifying these people um, and immortalizing them in, in art and in photography. The biggest challenge for me was the, the fact that I couldn't speak Javanese and it wasn't just Bahasa Indonesia, it was like a dialect, it was like Javanese uh, which was commonly spoken in the village and when I went there I had to work with a translator so um, many times there were a lot of miscommunication, like things were lost in translation and there were, there, there were a lot of misunderstandings. Um, towards the middle and towards the end of the project I actively picked up the language myself so it became simpler towards the end. Um, communication is one problem. Second problem was technique because um, cyanotype with batik is 
a relatively new technique. Well, at least we had not heard anybody else using something like that before. So it almost seems that like all our experiments had to actually start from scratch. And um, being able to actually balance that two elements onto one piece of medium was really difficult. Because for one, um, like as Kabu mentioned in the, the lecture, um, Batik kills cyanotype and cyanotype kills Batik. They, they are always at loggerheads with each other, mainly because the Batik process requires boiling, really, really high heat, and cyanotype cannot take high heat, and cyanotype bleeds into, the colours bleeds into the Batik, and it gets in a very strange mishmash. So a lot of it, um, in actually rediscovering the, the two techniques, was to actually recognise and accept the two different natures of it, and try to let it sit harmoniously with each other. It took, took us quite a long time, it took us six months for that. Mm. Batik itself, Japanese batik, for the very nature of it, 